So it's June 30th, 2004, and we're here with Alan and Henrietta Liner. And uh, welcome, we're delighted to have you here. We're at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. And we're going to chat a bit about the uh, careers of these two exceptional people, and uh, with particular reference to the work in the 19, late 1940s, 50s, and to some extent 60s at the National Bureau of Standards. So, um, Alan, let me start with you, if I may. Could you tell us a bit about just where you grew up, just very briefly, where you grew up, uh, and uh, maybe what school you went to? Is there anything that shaped your early interest in mathematics or computers? Well, I was brought up in New Rochelle, New York State. It was just a county. And uh, I went to school in New England, and uh, later at Yale, and uh, sometime in the Harvard Graduate School. Uh, this was a period of the Depression, and uh, I was interested in astronomy. I majored in mathematics and as well as astronomy. And uh, the chances of obtaining employment as an astronomer were, were nil. Who needed an astronomer? Uh, most people thought, didn't know the difference between an astronomer and uh, an astrologer. <laughs> Well, I had a, a job working for a couple of years in a, with a company that manufactured color cameras and uh, color photography materials. Uh, this was before the days of Kodachrome, and uh, the only way to make color prints was to uh, go through an elaborate process, which didn't always turn out well. But uh, when it did turn out well, it sort of resembled the, the uh, color prints you get today through color printers. Well, then came Pearl Harbor, and uh, so I had to find something else to do. So uh, the Naval Observatory started advertising in the New York Times for astronomers, of all things. So I applied there and uh, was assigned there to Washington, D.C. at the Naval Observatory, where I stayed for a couple of years. And then a, an emergency project showed up, top secret project, at the National Bureau of Standards. So I arranged for a, a transfer to there. And uh, there, I not only met Henrietta, but I worked on the radio proximity fuse uh, program that they had. The uh, radio proximity fuse was a small device with vacuum tubes in it, very uh, resistant to shock. The uh, vacuum tubes were called the rain, grain of rice vacuum tubes. And, uh, well, this was mounted on the noses of bombs, rockets, mortars, uh, all kinds of uh, missiles that rotated. Non-rotating missiles were another thing. That was a different project. And, uh, well, Let's, excuse me, stop, let me stop for a moment. Uh, should I go into any more detail about well, this? Why don't we, why don't we uh, break there, mm -hmm. and then we'll come up. Why don't you tell us, uh, mm -hmm. Mrs. Langer, about mm -hmm. Well, before I start with where I grew up and so forth, let me put in two interesting comments on what he's already said. When he worked for this color photography company in New York, he apparently took photographs for the copy, the um, covers of journals of some gorgeous women. And after we got married, and he brought his stuff and I brought my stuff and we combined our possessions, all of a sudden he produces all these gorgeous women and I think, what kind of background did he have? Wow! <laughs> right. That takes care of the color photography. They were toothpaste advertisements. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. Toothpaste advertisements. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, so he told me. <laughs> uh, 
And the second thing I have to supplement is what he said about his transfer from the Naval Observatory to the Bureau of Standards. The Bureau of Standards very much wanted to get him because we needed, it was a mathematical analysis group and we needed someone with his background to do research. And I was told to please do all the paperwork and get liner. So I helped out on the paperwork and he finally showed up March 1st 1940, I forget what. He remembers the day. He showed up and, um, well, I won't go into details, but we married afterwards. Mm -hmm. And when we married, I said to them, you told me to get liner, so I got liner. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that story. Right. Now, to start at the beginning, I was born in New York City. And I went to public school there. And to my great good fortune, they had a marvelous educational program for what they call gifted girls and boys, which I was categorized as. And um, I went to Hunter High School, which was a select high school, where we had a very intensive academic um, program, which I loved. I really loved it. And then after that, I went to Hunter College, which most of us did, and found college very easy. And um, I majored in both math and physics. And after that, I was very much interested in the foundations of mathematics, so I wanted to study a subject called symbolic logic which has applications in computers, though we didn't have computers at that time. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania where there was a professor who was a specialist in what was called modal logic. And I did my graduate work there. And then uh, because the government requested colleges to send them a roster of those students who had majored in math and physics. My name was uh, landed on somebody's desk in Washington, D.C. And I got this inquiry about whether I could come to Washington and do war work for the government. And of course, that war was a war that we all felt compelled to win. And um, although uh, I hadn't, I really wanted to go on and get a PhD, which I didn't, I only got my masters. But w I went to the government to do this war work. And when I got to the Civil Service Commission and walked in there, they thought I was applying for a secretarial job. This is how it was then. Right. And when I said no and showed them my letter and said I had majored in math and physics, the interviewer grabbed my arm with one hand and picked up the telephone with the other and shouted to somebody, I've got a physicist. And I said, no, 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 I'm a mathematician. I majored in physics as well, but I'm a mathematician. He said, from now on, you're a mathematical physicist. We need a physicist. So I was called a mathematical physicist. And I was sent to three places to see which job I would like to have. And it seems as though I was destined to meet Alan because one of the places I was sent to was the Naval Observatory, which I didn't like. They were very stuffy. But I did like the National Bureau of Standards. So I went to work there and I got liner. <laughs> now that's a perfect place for me to ask. In a previous conversation, you mentioned that you, you had actually had to leave once your husband had started working? Yes, at the, at the National Bureau of Standards, we both worked in the mathematical analysis group during World War II. And at the end of World War II, the head of our division decided that he didn't want to uh, have all these talented people get dispersed that he had collected so arduously during the war. And he managed to convince 
the Bureau stand is to start the computer program using these people as the, as the pioneering group to do the work. So um, he formed a computer group into which I was put because I wanted to be. And then Alan decided he wanted in. <laughs> But we couldn't both work there because there was a nepotism rule that you, a husband and a wife couldn't work together. Uh, that, was that waived during the war, though? No, it was not no. waived during the war. And they, um, they said it was because they thought he would favor me. And he said he certainly would. <laughs> so that fixed that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I left the computer group and went to, I still remained in the electronics division, and technically I went to another, to the electron tube laboratory, you know, where they had the cathode tube research. But I stayed very close to the computer field, and they were always asking me to write things and do things. So we actually did work closely with the computer people. Right. And, and the, anyway, the cathode ray tubes, as you know, were used by computers then. We were, we had to collaborate with them. What I want to ask, actually, is, is how the NBS first got into computers, or the, the electronic computers, the, the, the movement from punch card unit record methods, <coughs> which worked very well during the war, I think, um, and on the Manhattan Project and so on, um, to electronic computers. And to, can you well, explain how the interest in the projects came about? Yeah. Um, the head of our electronics division was a very remarkable man called Harry Diamond. Uh, he, he was um, uh, an engineer who had done some very fine work, uh, research work. And, uh, well, he, he developed an uh, electronic harness for aircraft engines. At that time, uh, aircraft engines made so much electronic noise that it wasn't possible to make decent radio communications between them. And his invention made that possible. This was before the war, I think. Yeah. Well, he had this reputation as a... cage or something around Well, it was called a, a harness. It was a network of connections to places in the engine. I don't know much about the details of he, it. He had a very fine mm -hmm. reputation mm -hmm. with the Army. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the ordnance people, who of course you know uh, funded the um, ENIAC, ENIAC. Right. Um, he had an in with the ordnance people. And he thought, well, this is something we can do because we had both electronics and mathematical people in our group who had turned out work that turned out to be so useful to the Army. Actually, it, not only to the Army, but our group got a gold medal from King George VI in England because our device was used when the V-2 bombs were, set, were uh, projected from Germany and Pinamunda to uh, England. Our device was sent up to the radio proximity fuse was sent up in order to detonate the missiles before they hit the people okay. on the ground and presumably saved many, many lives. Of course, uh, we were very... Excuse me. Uh, the the uh, proximity fuse could be set to detonate at any distance, oh, yeah. 50 yards or 100 yards that. from the target, which made a much bigger target, of course. Uh, and uh, the... the uh, kills on the missiles uh, frustrated the Germans who didn't <laughs> understand how the anti-aircraft guns they thought would be so accurate. <laughs> and uh, that was the reason. And it's based on uh, a magnetic field being perturbed by a large metallic uh, object? Well, it was uh, it the radio right. interfered. It gave out a radio signal oh, okay. which and bounced the off the target. Ah. And uh, the different the beat frequency indicated how fast the target was approaching. And uh, so there was mechanism in there and so on to uh, make it uh, could be set to uh, detonate at any particular distance. 
that's the work that we did. We, in the mathematical analysis group, we used to compute what was called the arming tables, how to arm the fuse so that it would go off where you wanted it to go off. And during World War II, we often worked till 4 a.m. because the planes were waiting to take those arming tables to Germany. It, they used it in the Battle of the Bulge in Germany. And um, we worked in couples because we didn't want to make a mistake. It would be fatal. So if, if, our, if our computations matched, we felt more secure. Mm -hmm. So we worked in couples and composed the arming, arming tables, which were then flown to the battlefield. And it was used in um, the Battle of the Bulge in Germany and in Britain and in Iwo Jima. So we, it, it, the uh, army was very happy with what we had done. And uh, so Harry Diamond sort of uh, uh, was able to get them to say, uh, all right, we will uh, fund the work if you start the research. And that's how we got into the, uh, the post-ENIAC uh, work. In 1946, right at the end of the war, we started the work. And in 1948, the Air Force gave us funds because they decided that the University of Pennsylvania people who were developing the UNIVAC wouldn't get it done in time for the 1950 census. And so um, they asked us, could, what, what could we do in a hurry? Well, what we did in a hurry was between 1948 and 1950, we worked real hard and we produced the SEAC, which, as you know, was put into operation before the UNIVAC. And um, it was the first internally programmed computer in this country. And Alan did the logical design. There's so a, couple that's of, a couple of things I wanted to mention or, or ask you about was mm -hmm. one, the role of tables. In the, what? the role of, of table computation yeah. in, oh. in driving, <laughs> because the ENIAC obviously was for firing tables, and, and these arming tables that you mentioned, were they pretty intensive computationally? To Ye yes, but, but, but that was all finished by right. the time we, yes, but um, the, uh, the reason that the SEAC, the, the um, qualifications that the SEAC had to fulfill were those that the Air Force needed, because at the, the ordinance got the Air Force to give them the money. And what was it that you were supposed to do for the Air Force on the SEAC? Well, the Office of the Air Controller uh, planned uh, programs for doing everything that an Army does, the organization. Uh, how many of this or that is needed for at what date? And uh, these produced uh, an enormous volume of data, which was, you know, sort of impossible to handle to in any uh, any organized way. Well, uh, here at Stanford University, uh, Dr. George Vansick had uh, invented this uh, linear programming method. Mm -hmm. Danzig, yeah. yeah. And uh, he needed something to compute using this method. So he granted the first large amount of funds to us to get started on, on the SEAC. And there was a, I'd say the principal donor financially uh, that made the SEAC possible. Uh, the Bureau could obtain, obtain money from other government agencies, and they did frequently, uh, the Bureau of the Census, Henry and yes. mentioned. They gave us money in order to mm -hmm. test, the, mm -hmm. test the UNIVAC when it was completed mm -hmm. to see if it met the performance um, qualifications that the government mm -hmm. uh, had requ mm -hmm. required of them. Mm -hmm. So our group did the testing of the UNIVAC when it was completed. So just in terms of a well. timeline, so I can understand. Uh, that was 1952, I believe. When was the UNIVAC tested? Uh, it was somewhere around. It was after the CIA. I think was it was after. It was, I think it was 1952 that the UNIVAC was te tested, and 
uh, accepted okay. for so the you, census. Right. Uh, the, the the date is listed in one of those yeah, uh, papers that. we gave. I thought you. it was 1950. But that's the year of the actual census itself. It, it wasn't ready in no. time. Oh, okay. and, and so SEAC was a way, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but the Air Force was looking for a way to uh, uh, to apply computational techniques like George Danzig. I guess was the term operations research. In, yeah. Uh, yes. In use that's then? right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And to uh, mm -hmm. kind of give put military logistical planning on a rational foundation. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so SEAC was, like, I, I, I might get confused between SEAC and, um, and pilot. Uh, oh, pilot. Oh, that's later. Much later. Was later. That's later. But yeah. SEAC have, uh, it was basically a, meant to be a, a platform to test different architectures and their various speeds, or am I getting it confused with The pilot, the pilot was that's mainly pilot. intended for that. So, so what brought about uh, SEAC then? SWAC. Well, they came about the same time. The SWAC was put into operation somewhat later, I think. I'm not too familiar with the SWAC. Harry Husky is the man to ask about that. Yeah. Uh, the the um, problems that SEAC was supposed to do uh, originated in different departments of the Bureau. When SEAC, when SEAC was finished, uh, the optics department had already programmed a, pro a uh, program for ray tracing. And uh, the first thing we did was to run that when the SEAC was operating and to uh, you know, design lenses with it. Uh, however, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, the real first part, uh, program that the SEAC ran was a very simple program which, which simply counted one, two, three, and so on. And uh, we prepared that uh, test machine. And of course we ran it uh, innumerable times and things didn't go right. And uh, one characteristic was that uh, when the machine got flustered, it would print out long, the printer would start printing out long series of nine, 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 nines, and so on. And uh, we had gotten so used to that that when finally we managed to put the program in and try to run it, the computer started clattering right away. And we said, well, it's wrong again. And then we looked at what was being printed, and it was printing one, two, three, four, five, six. So that was the first successful program running under its own steam. Uh, it, uh, the program was pulled in from, from the tape units on the outside and uh, loaded a small part of the uh, uh, memory and then bootstrapped along to fill up the mem memory further longer and then just went through this adding one and uh, repeatedly. And, uh, we didn't even bother putting a, a stop on it because we knew the computer would stop itself eventually. <clears throat> well, the tape, the uh, you know, the yellow tape that came out of a computer in those days with the result on it—a teletype machine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that kept coming out. This was 1950. That kept coming out of the computer. And, and as it came out, we were so exhilarated and so excited that the, the thing was working because a lot of people, when we started working on it, had said it'll never work. This, you know, we had a lot of naysayers. But here we realized that we had done it and it was working and we were just beside ourselves. So we took this tape and we wound it all around the staircase of the uh, it, w that you came into the building with, you know, like um, like you do at Christmas with greens. We decorated the all the staircases, and then we still had more. So we started hanging it out of the windows. The whole building was decorated with it, and this was at night because none of us went home, of course. W this was at night, and the next morning, the director of the bureau. <laughs> His chauffeur-driven limousine was taking him to his office, and he sees our building with paper hanging. <laughs>
paper hanging all over it. He was outraged, stopped his limousine and kept stumping up the stairs and said, what's going on here? <laughs> we said, it works, it works, come see, it works, it works. Well, we showed it to him that it was working and explained to him it was working. He went to his office and guess what he did? He called up Congress and he told the congressman we had this marvelous machine and they kept trooping up and then, then oh, it was just such a, a wild time because everybody, see, he was a politician. He knew, to, right. he knew whom to invite up. So, um, so then, then uh, shortly after that, about a month after that, the SEAC was dedicated formally and it was in the New York Times. <clears throat> the announcement was in the New York Times about this giant brain that had been developed <laughs> in the Bureau of Standards. I wanted to ask you a couple of things. One, oh, and, and yeah. I did check the date on, the, uh, on when we checked up on the UNIVAC, and it was 1951. Ah, okay. This was 1950 when we got the machine dedicated and working. And then we checked up on the UNIVAC in 19, so they must have been ready in 1951. But one of the questions I have is, uh, one of the impressions that we get from people, especially the people in the first generation, I'm thinking of Cuthbert Hurd, for example, who told me when they got the 701 running and <coughs> did some calculation as a test, and he said, boom, it just came out. And he thought, how are we going to keep this thing busy? Was that a common? Did you experience that? That you would never be able to use all these cycles? Let him tell you. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a bankers convention in Washington. Bankers. Ba bankers. Bankers. Yes, yeah, sparking people. And uh, some of us went down there and uh, explained what we'd done. And uh, we said, here's this machine that can make uh, a thousand multiplications per second. And uh, Oh, we couldn't use a machine like that. Our girls couldn't put the numbers in that <laughs> fast. Oh, that's interesting. That, uh, and that's fairly typical. Uh, you couldn't get the, people to understand what, what... We had it available for them to use, but they didn't understand. As a matter of fact, we didn't even understand because though we knew what, what we had done, we didn't foresee what would happen. Right. I mean, the, the fact is that no bank now can run without them, and they wouldn't even look at it then. Well, in these early days, uh, was the hardware design fairly straightforward? Did you have any real difficult problems? And, and then I want to talk about software. Okay. Well, uh, the electronic people, uh, well, I'm, I'm not an electronic engineer, uh, that devised some uh, unit circuits a, a limited number of pieces that could be put together to uh, cr create a logical function of some simple one, but one was was needed to work properly. And they did a good job of that. And uh, we invented a, uh, uh, a notation process uh, in which uh, you could draw s small functional boxes, which could then be converted into the el electronic form. They were logical boxes. And uh, it was worked quite successfully. We did it without any appreciable errors that I was ever, ever found out. And in a rather short time. Uh, of course, when, when there's a, um, a pioneering project like this going on, a lot of people are interested, and uh, the uh, place is full of people saying, can you make something that looks like this, and so on, drawing the circuit diagrams in the air, which is not a very good place to record them. <laughs> and so time passed, and time passed, and uh, a lot of talk was going on, but not too much <laughs> recording. So the, the, my boss came to me and said, for God's sake, can't you do something about this? So I, I took the stuff and took a lot of it home to the dining room table <laughs> and uh, furious, furiously worked out 
a design that was on paper that could be converted into electronic equipment. And uh, well, it, all I can say is it worked to everybody's surprise. So your, your function was what we would call today an architect, is that right? Yes, that's and, right. You know, the, that was the name, the Assistant architect. architect, yeah. And so mm -hmm. can you tell us who your influences were? I guess the IAS machine, obviously. And did, or, or did you just come up with this? Well, uh, well we, uh, we had people from, from the IAS, one person in particular, who had a, he was a graduate student. I, I don't think he had much experience with the, their work on the computer then. And he had good ideas. And, uh, Do you remember his name? No. Yeah, Ralph Slutz. Oh. S-L-U-T-Z. Uh, okay. But he, he, uh, he was a physicist and he didn't want anything to do with the computers after SEAC was finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We have uh, nine more minutes, and we have to change tape. Oh. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, after CX was finished, he, he left and went to work on, uh, uh, oh, the, uh, what do you call the radiation belts in the upper atmosphere. Oh, the Van Elk? In Boulder, Colorado. Well, uh, it was Still at the National Bureau yeah. of Standards, mm -hmm. but at the mm -hmm. Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I'd say that most significant influence was Samuel Lubkin, Dr. Sam Lubkin. L-U-B-K-I-N. Are you familiar, familiar with the name? I've never heard of him. Never heard no, of him. No, he, he never got enough credit for yeah. what... He okay. was a very brilliant man, and uh, he had a lot of ideas which went into, into the EDVAC, okay. which was finished a good many years later. And uh, some, of the, some of his ideas uh, came into the SEAT too. Though I ended up being, uh, well, having to make decisions on what to do in the face of a lot of alternatives. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lubkin, who was a real genius in some respects, but he was very hard to get along with. And, uh, Whenever anyone he went after with a proposal or an idea, he would say, this idea is not only absolutely useless, but also positively detrimental. And except, that was a standard expression. I have uh, to uh, add here, uh, he said that to everybody except Alan. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so you got through the filter. Yeah. <laughs> not without some difficulty. <laughs> He was very hard to get along with. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was about the only person who was on speaking terms. With him. <laughs> so, let's talk about uh, the SEAC and, and some of the software. Uh, any interesting software stories? Well, I didn't have too much to do with software. They, they, uh, there really wasn't any. Uh, they, they, um, everything was machine language. And uh, I don't know, it was well on before anybody implemented what they called um, automatic programming. Uh, I, I know uh, one person I remember in the, the, the talking about how to get people to use the machine said, well, since everything is in binary numbers, we have to get a lot of clerks on hand to uh, convert binary uh, decimal numbers into binary numbers. And of course the answer was, well, what do you think the machine is here for? How interesting. <laughs> is it just a gestalt that people don't have yeah. at that time? Mm -hmm. well, uh, uh, there was a programmer at the National Bureau of Standards by the name of Ida Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S, uh, who was who was um, really more prescient than any of the rest of us because she foresaw what could be done with computers in a way that none of the rest of us did. She stood up one day at the, one of the Bureau of Standards lectures and, and she was always very uh, gestural. She said, the time is coming when we will have all the libraries of the world 
at our fingertip to consult. Mm -hmm. The rest of us thought, boy, there goes Ida again. Yes. <laughs> you know? She was closer to right than any of us. Yes, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. very far ahead of her mm -hmm. time. She was, she was mm -hmm. a very small woman. Mm -hmm. One thing that I noticed in the reading about the, the pilot, anyway, was uh, one of the deficiencies of SEAC was very slow I.O. Is that, That's is right. That right. Can you tell us a bit about that? Or, and any other strengths or weaknesses of the system, lessons that you learned? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the um, Sea Act was supposed to be produced quickly with a minimum of money spent on it. So one of the things we uh, decided was not to build a lot of these facilities, but to design them well enough so that they would uh, essentially could be connected to the machine. So we put in these extra connections, which didn't go anywhere originally, but were there when we needed them in a little later to make expansion on a, what C I could do. Uh, well, the input output was a problem. My native tapes in the beginning didn't work well. Uh, in fact, I remember getting a, a visit uh, I remember getting a visit from one of the security agencies. It wasn't called CIA then, but I think it was, you know, one of those groups. And he told me they were convinced that the Russians would never come up with a computer because magnetic tapes had flaws in them. Well, of course they had flaws in them. And People found out how to get around them and make reliable tapes. They thought nobody, they thought nobody else could do that. Uh, I just give that an example of the misjudgment people had about machines and what it took to make them. Uh, so one of the things that I noticed about uh, computers was that some of the plans made no provision whatever to the people and how the people would use them. They were hired for machines where they loaded the memory by giving the mathematician a screwdriver, an insulating <laughs> screwdriver, and went around touching places inside the machine to put zeros and ones. In. Yeah. Well, so I delivered, uh, devoted considerable thought to what I call the manual monitor system. and. Uh, the manual referred to the things could the, that the operator could do by merely punching the keyboard, the input keyboard. So he could read out the uh, individual instructions and the machine had a, had a, uh, a one instruction at a time mode, which did one instruction and then waited and printed out the well, the contents of various registers and uh, instructions and so on, all the details. And it could be left running, uh, you know, by itself that way, and it provided a simple way of, of debugging it. Of course, it needed a lot of debugging programs, they always do. So I, I think we were ahead of uh, most people in uh, figuring out what the user had to put up with when he sat down at the machine. And uh, in short order, a number of uh, programmers had written up programs for well, binary decimal conversions and then vice versa, of course. And uh, so it wasn't as nearly as bad getting started as it, as it was in some places I've heard of. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. So are there any... Um the next machine that you worked on at NDS was this the Statag? Dyseang. The Dyseang. And then the Statag. And then the pilot. Yeah. So what's the scoop and the Statag? Well, the, 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 those preceded the, the pilot. Mm -hmm. Right. But the, in, in 1952, there was the Dyseag. Mm -hmm. And that, the particular facet of that that was interesting was that it was a machine to be uh, installed in a trailer van right. so that it could be uh, it was mobile and it was mm -hmm. uh, do you want to yeah. talk about yeah. the are, are we at the right stage I don't want to jump ahead if, if, is 
that well, between SEAC and that you, you want you, you want to know more about the SEAC? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's see, where were we? Uh, about the user making it easy to use? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, also, I referred to briefly before, making it easy to install other equipment. Some of the equipment was uh, internal equipment, like SEAC. We put in something with uh, a lot of extra counter registers, which could be used for different purposes in an experimental way. Uh, so there were really a, a variety of ways in which the machine could be used. Now, one of the things that we were uh, limited by in the beginning was uh, memory. Uh, memory was expensive and we used mercury uh, acoustic delay lines. And we had uh, 256 uh, words of memory. Each word was 48 bits or 45 were bits. Were these mercury uh, tents or solid delay lines? Uh, these were tubes about a yard long, filled with mercury, and it took uh, a certain number of microseconds. Eight times 48 uh, uh, microseconds to go from one end to the other. There's a quartz uh, uh, transmitter and a quartz receiver, and uh, the pulse, a nice smooth pulse could go through there. And, uh, it's the, the same as the EDSAC. Uh, besides the acoustic uh, memory, uh, memory, the uh, delay line memory, uh, we added a Williams tube memory with uh, 45 uh, bits available in parallel. I, perhaps I should have mentioned earlier that SEAC was serial throughout. That is to say, a, a, a word was a, s a series of 45 bits, and the bits would come into a delay line and uh, would be uh, acted on by the logical s switches one at a time. And uh, two bits from two different words would be inputted to the adder at the same time, and the adder would produce the resultant bit and a carry bit, which was available to participate in the, along with the next bit. No, the the not, standard thing. That architecture, a serial architecture, mm -hmm. is, is an outgrowth of the main memory this, of the delay line, is it not? The serial nature of the delay line? Is that yeah, kind of yes. Hand yes, uh, there was, uh, it was, the, the serial idea was built into it in the beginning because the only way, way to store pulses at that time was in a delay line of some sort. Well, not the only way, but the only really fast way. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, so you upgraded the memory to Williams tubes. And yeah. Were you involved in, you right. mentioned you were in the vacuum tube division. Yes. Is that yes. related to building better yeah. Williams tubes? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, the, the Williams tube is not a small tube, it's a big tube. It, it was a display tube, actually, a CRT, which uh, had to be large enough to uh, have room for all the pits in it. So these were, you wouldn't call these Williams tubes? Yeah. Well, uh, cathode, ray cathode ray tubes, uh, as contrasted with vacuum tubes. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. So you know, vacuum, vacuum tube, I mean, uh, you know, some of this big and, right. uh, so, and uh, you, you could look at the face of a Williams tube and see what was stored there because that, the ones were illuminated and the zeros were blank. And, uh, well, the idea is that, that it was a parallel device, which supposedly is much faster than a serial device. So we started with this serial device with uh, 45 words going through one microsecond after each. 45 bits. Yeah, 45 bits, I mean. So. But now, for the following machine, one of the men in my group, or a couple of the men in my group, came up with an idea 
for making a uh, uh, an adder that would add 45 bits in one microsecond. That's a, Is that a serial parallel conversion. Well, it's a it's a, par a serial parallel scheme, mm. and uh, but it was serial basically made out of serial components, and it was. And I don't know, 100 or 50 times faster, I forget exactly what it was. So it was not a parallel machine or a parallel adder, really. And um, I think we gave you some of the, those papers hmm. about the adder. <laughs> was this Arnold yes. Weinberger's work? And yes, yeah. Weinberger and Smith. And I think you mentioned in these reports, you mentioned it's yes. effectively equivalent to a one microsecond. That's right, yeah. 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 What was the clock frequency, by the way, of the scale? Yeah. One megacycle. Yeah. One megacycle? Yeah, million heights. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I wanted to ask a bit about the, the problem space that SIAC was <laughs> designed to address. What, what kind of problems were people solving? Well, uh, general purpose problems. Uh, as people got problems, they somehow figured how to put them on a machine to, to, to turn a problem into a program. So these would be problems in, in scientific problems? Yes. So that's uh, the National Bureau of Standards yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. Because I noticed, I think, in the, the Air Force uh, had, which surprised me, and a need, the, the first need they said they had was like, almost an accounting uh, or um, sort of more prosaic calculations, mm -hmm. like payroll, mm -hmm. which surprised me for a scientific well, uh, it depends the, who gave you the money. It was mathematical, of course. That there was the machine was doing arithmetic and mathematics, but uh, when it's doing arithmetic, uh, it's the same arithmetic no matter what the numbers mean. And, and so, uh, you say that was prosaic, but it was uh, very original in other respects. It, uh, the people, the uh, Accounts with the eye shades working with pens yes. didn't do things the same way as the programmers do, and but it ended up the same same problem. So aside from mm -hmm. generally uh, supporting the you know scientists at MBS and their mission, mm -hmm. are there any specific kind of uh, you know grand challenge problems we might call them? For well, the yeah, yeah, the yeah, yes, they, in the. Uh, the pamphlet about uh, the introduction of uh, SEAC, there's some problems listed. Uh, do, do you have the page here? Um, I, I don't. No, it's the, the blue book with the little. Oh, no, blue book I didn't bring cover. it to you. No. Oh, he means that little. Uh, a, a new tool for the mind or something like that. Yeah. I think there's a list of them in there. There was that optics problem. Well, those were, the, those were the problems that mm. were just done mm. before the dedication, which we listed. So the lens makers formula mm. was one of them. Well, I suppose the I optics, can tell you yeah. that the AEC did problem, gave us problems. Mm. And the, uh, and the um, National Security Agency gave us problems. There was some, there was some, yeah. there was some classified yeah. Yeah. work that yeah. I wasn't yeah. allowed to talk about mm -hmm. in what I wrote. Mm -hmm. So, and we, I don't even know if it's declassified yet. <laughs> Maybe it is, but well, anyway, mm -hmm. the, the classified stuff we never wrote mm -hmm. about. We knew about mm -hmm. it. We did the work, mm -hmm. but we never wrote about it. Well, there was the, uh, something, something a, a man whose name I forget, who I think was uh, really brilliant in this respect, came up with something called the DIRO, D-Y-I-R-O, Dynamic Reputation of Operations. D dynamic rep Representations of uh, Operations. And in that, we got a line, telephone line, from the airport uh, to SEAC, and uh, put in the uh, information on the scope uh, of the uh, uh, radar picture of the flights going on around the airport at that time. 
and at the same time we fed in SEAC information, SEAC is information. So the, the uh, radar information from the airport was available for SEAC and it could, it could compute various rather simple things at the time. Hmm? Sage. Sage. Yes, I guess it's the yeah. same idea. Yeah. 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 And uh, so, so we did some of that. And uh, <laughs> well, one thing I remember about it that impressed us: we were in very crowded quarters, and the SEAC was in a building which was got kind of dilapidated, and so uh, the space just started appearing between the walls and the floor. <laughs> But that, that isn't what I want to talk about now. We closed it off so the people couldn't see it, but we put the scope and the keyboard outside in a little compartment and put a black cloth over the where, what it, where the wires went. And we did an operation of this sort that you mentioned. And uh, a general came in and he was astonished that we had compressed so much in. Oh. <laughs> well, do a little typewriter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, well, what was it like when you walked into the machine room? And what what uh, was it noisy? Did it have a smell to it? Or? Uh, well, nearly everything smelled of ammonia from the copying machines. That it was the atmosphere we were brought up in, uh, and the the, the teletype is noisy and it's greasy and uh, it's a pain in the neck and we replaced them with something better called the flexor rider, which was more like a typewriter. And uh, uh, paper tape readers, uh, of course, drove the flexor rider. And the, the flexor rider, uh, the, the machine produced paper tapes, which ran into the flexor rider. So we essentially we were using the flexor rider as an output device. But then you asked about input, output uh, input and output device. Uh, there was a, a device that uh, solved a very difficult question. The question was how to, to get a big reel of tape rolling in, a, you know, milliseconds without flying apart to pieces and to, you know, record at those speeds on the tape. So this fellow, by the name of Jim Pike produced a device called, which he called Pike's Peak, and which the the tape was just spewed out of the machine, but into a, between two pieces of glass, the width of the tape, and the tape, you know, couldn't get knotted. It was perfectly, uh, I mean, it was. Uh, was not uh, distorted or folded or anything, yeah. And so there were these uh, big uh, plate glass uh, uh, pa panels, uh, which were, you know, a yard across and a yard, yard down, uh, containing uh, this uh, unrolled tape, and uh, it worked very well. I wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. Everything Alan said, of course, was true, but the, air, the uh, re computer required that it be in an air-conditioned room. Mm -hmm. So this decrepit room that it was in was air-conditioned. The rest of the place, the rest of the Bureau of Standards was not in those days. And Washington in the summertime, when you're not air-conditioned, is really something. So although the room may have seemed decrepit, we couldn't wait to get into it because outside it was so um, muggy and so unpleasant that they used to put jars of salt tablets in the halls so that the scientists could go out and take a salt tablet because you would perspire so much in the, um, in the summer in Washington doing your work that you'd, get, you'd need the salt. So I can tell you that no matter what was in the computer room, it was Better nirvana than, because yes. it was air conditioned. How interesting. And, uh, and how big was it? How big, how was, big was the machine? I mean, when you look at 
It was the length of this room. It, uh, it, it would have fit into the this, this into room. the about a half of this room. So the people on tape actually don't know what the room is, but um, if you have how just, how big how lo how long was the theac? How many feet? Well, I think you're going to answer that question by looking at one of the photographs we gave here of the machine. I don't remember. It was all in one room. And it was it was the length of the room. Did it have special power like a motor generator in the basement or? Anything? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't remember whether that was. Uh, uh, well, the thing that amazes me is how fast you put this together. We worked very it's hard. Really, quite novel. I know. <laughs> two years. I, two years. People mm -hmm. couldn't believe that we could go from um, from his design mm -hmm. to a, a, a dedication day when the computer really worked in two years. It really was a. a and it went for until 1964. It it was decommissioned in 1964. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. it's active life was quite long. Almost 15 years. Yeah. Much longer than most other computers. Uh, yes. I never heard of one that was in use for 15 years. No. And then mm. when, when it was decommissioned, mm. uh, they took a, a piece of equipment and donated it to the Smithsonian Institution, which wanted it Good. as a memento. So did the style of problems change as it went through its life? Uh, I guess because there are new machines that would come to compete with it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But what, what made it last is, I guess, what I'm asking is why it lasted last to 1964. Yeah, uh, well, the, the Bureau finally started producing problems. At first, uh, the, it was very hard to get, get the other scientists and other uh, kinds of work, like. yeah, how, how they could use it in their work. It really was revolutionary, the idea of sitting down and typing instead of uh, you know, reading uh, instruments, you know, with microscopes and so <laughs> on. And so that produced, that, that proceeded rather slowly. Uh, and I, I remember going all around trying to persuade people. And uh, it was a difficult job. And, uh, well, I left the Bureau in 1960 and uh, I don't think a great deal had been done in uh, expanding the use. I, I can tell you one story, though. A, a young fellow who worked for me, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you, uh, Oh, yes, please, yeah, uh, yeah, a, a young yeah. fellow who worked for me had uh, had a job in the uh, optical section, spectroscopy section, earlier before he came to me. And uh, he observed uh, an elderly woman who had spent her life computing tables. I don't know what the tables were, wavelengths and converting wavelengths to wave numbers or something like that. Uh, uh, an interminable <laughs> series of computations. And uh, he thought he could help her. And, uh, so he said, uh, give me some of your work there, and I'll put it on the computer, and you'll see how it works. And you won't have to do it this way. Well, she gave him the stuff, and uh, here's, you know, six months' worth of work. And she gave it to him, and he took it away, and he brought it back, you know, in a day or two, all done and printed out. <laughs> and she burst into tears. <laughs> <laughs> all that time. It, dep it depends who it is. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I'm the name I couldn't remember a moment ago, Dirk Brower, D-I-R-K, Dirk, and B-R-O-U-W-E-R. He was a rather famous uh, mathematical astronomer. Uh, he was at uh, Yale? Yeah. Uh, we uh, computed orbits. A lot of computers with the transit instrument, and uh, so I, I had a lot of experience doing the drudgery of computing. Then uh, later, at the Naval Observatory, there was all kinds of drudgery uh, computing, 
And uh, some of us try to figure out ways of putting stuff on the keyboards to, you know, hit a number of keys at the same time and so on. But generally the uh, feeling was against that. It was somewhat immoral not to spend the time uh, <laughs> okay. agonizing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I said, boy, there must be a better way of doing this. <laughs> And uh, I had a little experience with the punch cards machines there, and uh, you could die carrying the trays of cards around, you know, and uh, putting them in place. There must be a better way of doing this. And uh, it remained kind of a, you know, a, an abstract idea until uh, the, uh, the uh, notion of computers came up, inspired by the, uh, uh, Ed Beck. Hmm? Ed Beck. No, uh, you know the first computer. Uh, ENIAC. ENIAC. I meant yeah. ENIAC. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a, a c computer machine, uh, but then a, a program computer in the sense that the later computers were. Didn't store its program. Yeah, it didn't store the program. At least it stored it in plug boards and right. things of that sort. Mm. Uh, so uh, this really was the culmination of something that I had wanted for a long time before, but I had no notion that it was it was a possibility. And uh, so there was a lot of satisfaction in running a computer, well, my own personal computer which years later I, I had, I could do in, uh, you know, in no time, essentially, what took hours and hours of, of, of work uh, previously. Inverting matrices, for instance, which is no fun to do with a, a head computer. But, uh, I remember when ENIAC uh, mm -hmm. was finally decommissioned, they said it, it had computed more during its lifetime than all calculations in, in human history up to that point. Well, I guess that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the famous mathematicians, like Gauss, for instance, spend a lot of their time just doing brute force computing. And uh, Gauss's ideas, you know, were extended about 100 years after his death. Uh, th they found in his, you know, back in the back part of his desk drawer, <laughs> all kinds of things that took 100 years for other people to, th oh, to think yes. of. Mm -hmm. And he spent most of his life computing. So, and you, your story reminds me of Gene Amdahl in a sense, because he was also an astronomer. Amdahl was an astronomer. Alan used to oh, say, "Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know." That. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and exactly the same. You know, mother is a necessity of invention kind of motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just overwhelmed by the amount of calculations involved in, in astronomy. Mm -hmm. and that's what he did. used to say. That's perfect. That's the perfect prerequisite for mm -hmm. turning into a mm -hmm. computer. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and, and what's Designer. really interesting is that, in a sense, I mean, both of you were kind of outsiders in a way, and, you know, in, in terms of, you know, we weren't electrical engineers, or, mm -hmm. but maybe no, it didn't matter right. at that time, I and mean, nobody was an expert, mm -hmm. I guess, at that time. Uh, th that's right. That electrical engineering was something apart. Uh, well, I really didn't have much, I didn't have much electrical engineering uh, background at all. Mm -hmm. I never really took a course in it uh, while I was in school, anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good thing. You don't know what's not possible. We heard a lot about what was not possible when we were trying to do the work. There's so many naysayers, and it happened in when I went into neuroscience as well. The, I, the, to ask the, a I, I just this is the same point. The um, when when I first proposed the hypothesis about the cerebellum, which later was confirmed. The reviewer, the um, peer reviewer of the paper, turned it down with the comment, "This couldn't possibly be true, or we would have thought of it long ago." Mm. And you know, mm. we had a problem getting getting the thing peer reviewed so it could be published, so that some experimental work would be done. You can't confirm something unless it's published, right. and you can't get it published if nobody will. It's I, a problem. I, I wanted to ask you first. There's a quote by uh, 
tend to do it was at famous computer designers and don't worry about having original ideas. If they're truly original, you'll have to ram it down people's throats. Uh, you know, they said don't worry about people stealing your ideas because if they're original, <laughs> they won't believe you anyway. And that's yeah. true. And, yeah. and then the other thing I wanted to ask you was about this cultural uh, meme, if you like, or, or uh, current about the giant brain. And I um, think you're kind of uniquely qualified, maybe, to answer that. Well, well, <laughs> and uh, why that came up, how it came up. And the, the reason that they called it a giant brain was because it was so big and because it was so fast. It was so fast that when he put his one, two, three program in, as he said, he barely got his hands up off the computer when it went <laughs> and he thought it was, it was a bug and there was something wrong and it was just so fast. So they called it a giant brain, but we always opposed that because we felt it was a misnomer. It was a giant tool for the human brain. And it wouldn't work without the human brain. You've got to program it. So, um, so we hated that word, and we tried to avoid calling it that. But that was the popular way of referring to these big automatic computers, which was so different from the desktop things that we used to use. Mm -hmm. Well, a journalist, you know, like to play things up, uh, and uh, it's an interesting thing to compare a computer to a, a robot, you know, and so on. And uh, but th that was their imagination, uh, really, you know, and, and not the people working in the field. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. People who knew what a computer was would never yeah. consider it a giant yeah. brain, I guess. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, although, yeah, like, I, I just wonder what the origins of that are. Like, well, you know Edmund Berkeley, you remember him? Oh, that's it, yes. Okay. He Pardon? founded, Edmund, Edmund Berkeley, Berkeley oh, yeah. founded the, um, the, um, the ACM. Right. Yeah. Giant brains are machines. He, he, he talked that way for, the, for right. a time. He, he was a, a promoter, and although we didn't agree with what he said, he did keep people, get people interested in the in computers. And I don't know, he got into some kind of a, 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 a disputes with his colleagues and they kicked him out. And he went away with all his records. So there's no record of, of who was uh, a member of the ACM in the early days, Interesting. 1947. You know, about a month ago, mm -hmm. I was poking around our archives and I actually found two boxes of Edmund Berkeley's papers. Really? Oh. Where did they come stunned. from? I, I think they came to us, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, from Ken Olson, mm -hmm. who is the fa founder of DEC, mm -hmm. Digital Equipment, one of the founders, oh. mm -hmm. and with whom this museum was closely aligned when it first began. Mm -hmm. So I'm not positive, but if you're ever interested in looking at those, they're mainly dealing with his uh, Simon computer, this little kit that he made, mm -hmm. called Simon, I don't know if you yeah. remember that. But it's mainly correspondence with you know young kids and uh, well, trying to build his kit and saying mm -hmm. no, don't give up and it's, it, I know it's hard and mm -hmm. it's quite expensive actually uh, as a kid mm -hmm. four hundred dollars yeah. so it's a lot of money anyway we digress a little um, I think we'll put SEAC to bed unless <laughs> there's anything else you want to say about it what have I left out anything well no I guess okay because the documents that you donated are fantastic mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you're, especially you're, on the later machines, the disc jack and the pilot. Uh, you say you're going to make a transcript to, to read. We could, I suppose we have an opportunity to adding. Uh, yes, you do. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, something yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So what? But well, you <laughs> haven't got the documents to look at anymore to refer to. Well, we wanted, gave them all to you. You could, you could, if you wanted to review it here, mm -hmm. or maybe we can copy them. And well, uh, uh, the, the, we do, the have, we do have some, yeah. co we some of the them, stuff we have. We do have some stuff. Oh, um, yes, we have a lot of duplicate copies. We have some copies. Do, do you want duplicate copies? No. And so we'll, yeah. see, uh, we'll see when we get the transcript. OK. Um, so what came after SEAC? Well, what, what came after SEAC? Yeah, uh, that, that the uh, SEAC. Uh, the, the Signal Corps wanted a machine to operate out of its uh, approving grounds, at least at first, uh, to uh, well, do everything that uh, the uh, airport needs to do, uh, and uh, 
the question there was uh, durability and reliability. So uh, uh, we took the original uh, small, small packages of SEAC and instead designed a logic package that consisted of uh, OR gates, feeding AND gates, feeding OR gates into a vacuum tube, which sent a new signal out somewhere or, or back to itself. And uh, so each one of these little boxes was a very obvious sort of a logical unit to think in terms of. And you could put these boxes together in your head and on paper uh, very rapidly and accurately. One of the things that bothered me most was the question of how in the world do you get this uh, avalanche of uh, data correct? You can't hire clerks to do it. That would be a disaster. And, uh, you know, one wrong bit, well, you, you don't remember the uh, multiple, what's the, uh, the multiplier or what's, what's the name? Uh, you know, this big benefactor. The biggest manufacturer. Intel? Uh, Intel, Intel. Intel. You remember Intel's multiplier had a bit wrong? Oh, the and, and, and uh, they sent out the, I don't know how many customers. <laughs> yes. uh, Hundreds of thousands. Uh, no good of. Uh, <laughs> well, that was always a nightmare, you know, that this would happen. And SEAC somehow was. Uh, uh, was divinely blessed, <laughs> <laughs> and there were, weren't any errors. But the question of building the second machine then was another matter. So w what I did was work out a system whereby uh, each of these little blocks could be represented on a card, and that card would contain the data, the inputs and the outputs, and, and so on, of the uh, other packages to which it was connected. And uh, <laughs> there was something called a magnetic card, which was this. It was a, tr a tray full of index cards with tiny magnets embedded in the paper of the cards. And there were magnets in the in the tray in the side of the tray, so that when you loaded it up with cards, instead of being every which way, the cards opened out and opened this way, and so it was very easy to work with. And what had to be done was to take the logical diagrams, which uh, contained all the necessary connections, and uh, simply transfer what you saw on the, on the chart to the uh, little table on the card. And it was very easy and easy to check. And you could have one person check another person's work. And uh, there was no talking and waving of hands in the air about it. it uh, and. Uh, so this was a design methodology that yeah. you now, helped you design yeah. the system? Yeah, we call it the magnetic, magnetic card system. So, I've never heard of that. Method. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, the other thing was the pronounceable names. Uh, yeah, how do you t talk about a, a place in the machine and another place in the machine to be connected together? You've got to each give each signal police a name. And uh, what kind of a name can you give it? Uh, numbers? That really isn't the right way to do it. And I got this idea from someone about generating pronounceable names. And uh, so we worked out a scheme of uh, four letter words, a few three letter ones too, but mostly four letter words. Uh, which I devised an algorithm for making them pronounceable. 
And uh, I didn't devote a great deal of time to it. I'm sure this is somebody who really wanted to put his heart into it could do it. But anyway, we were in a position where we could generate alphabetical lists of four-letter words. Uh, well, one of the problems was, uh, as you know, with four-letter words, some of the combinations we did not want to <laughs> want to use. And they were talking uh, to each other. Yeah. And there were women yeah. around. Yeah. The engineers could could discuss them uh, uh, among, among themselves and so They were on. using these words to talk about their designs, yeah. so, so they had to have yeah. words that they could pronounce yeah. Yeah. and that were acceptable. Right. So the only, only thing to do <laughs> was to run off the whole list of names and then expurgate from that list the ones that we didn't want. So we had to prepare a, a list of the names that we didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a problem. And our pl place was always full of congressmen and so on, <laughs> snooping around, and we didn't want them to see us play, uh, playing word games. <laughs> so uh, one of the fellows came in at night, and uh, he expurgated the names and expurgated the the expurgated list <laughs> of, of names. I wrote a paper like on that with it by him, which gives the algorithm. And it, it was, it's really very good because um, it's an error catching thing. If you made an error, you come up with an illegitimate name. And of course, a com computer could always check for legitimacy. So uh, all of the data was put to the screen, and the odds of a uh, uh, a uh, illegitimate name getting through were very, very small and negligible. So I, I don't know whether anyone else uses it, but I always thought that was a good idea. You know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, women, the secretarial mm -hmm. staff that his mm -hmm. group, or section they were called it, the section head, mm -hmm. were rather straight-laced, middle-aged ladies. And we were so worried. You know, you couldn't ask them to expurgate it, God forbid. So we were so worried that they would catch word of what was going on and think there was something terrible about the men. Yeah. Um, what, what were you doing at this, this well, time? Well, I, I was still at the uh, electronic tube laboratory, but he did a good deal of his work at home, usually after 10 p.m. It, it, during the office hours, he would get interrupted so, and he would say he couldn't keep things straight in his head. It's sure. difficult. So the hardest thing he would do at home, and I would watch. So that's how I learned it, because I wasn't in the computer group. But um, we were hysterical about this whole problem about the four-letter words and what was he going to do about them. <laughs> you ran that program on SIAC? Or what, uh, the, the, the pronounceable words were for the for, for, for the, the Dicea. I guess that's where we, we started. I think. So tell us a bit about the mm -hmm. the kind of problems, you know, the project, how it came about, what problems it was meant to solve. Well, uh, the interesting technical challenges. Well, of, of course, there were the, the the question of the circuit design, which I was really not part of that. I just was interested in the in the logic of the circuit. Uh, I guess we, we didn't have a mandate to, to do anything. We did what we dreamed up uh, and uh, try to get people to make use of it. Uh, the, the census people, for instance, uh, they didn't use the SEAC, at least not for any great deal, not a great deal. They, they were interested in the, in the UNIVAC. And uh, they provided a lot of ideas to us about uh, the, uh, or what the important jobs were. Uh, sorting, for instance, was a, a big deal with the census people. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was a, a Mac McPherson, not the Jim McPherson of IBM, but I don't know whether he was his brother or what, 
uh, who was a, a real whiz at uh, generating census applications of, the, of a machine. The UNIVAC, for, for instance, uh, the, the uh, type of operations they needed. And I don't know, there's nothing really peculiar about them that, you know, wouldn't be spread to other uh, areas. The, the DICEAC, mm. um, how does that fit in with oh. MBS's evaluation of the UNIVAC? Was that about the same time? Uh, no, I don't think it figured in. Uh, but I didn't tell you about the DICEAC, really. Right. Uh, and how that differed from the SEAC. It was basically very similar, but it had, you know, improvements in, in, in many ways and extra uh, operations. I remember with SEAC, for instance, some people were saying, the machine is going to do add, subtract, multiply, but divide is out of the question. It's much too complicated. And, um, uh, well, how do you do arithmetic <laughs> on the table? Instead of adding together a lot of numbers, you subtract, if you do long division, you subtract the numbers. What's the difference between add and subtract? Well, more than a bit. Uh, and with multiplication, you shift from left to right, from, from right to left. With division, you go from left to right. Well, we've had all the machines. With the multiplication, you've got everything in the machine you need to divide without spending one nickel extra except for, you know, five or six little, little gate, little germanium diode gates. So when you build, build a machine that multiplies, it divides. Well, so I put in the divide in the machine against everybody's uh, <laughs> intentions. Uh, and uh, things like that happen uh, as you go along. You have a lot of counters, and you can use them for different programming things. and. Uh, they were all the same counters, and it's, uh, but the ability to uh, make a stack and, you know, make a, a, a display, address number displacement and so on, th those are all uh, sort of uh, little gimmicks that a computer should do. And uh, very often the same equipment we use for, for uh, all of them. Can you tell us a bit about uh, the MBS review of UNIVAC? Well, uh, some of us were responsible for uh, testing the, the UNIVAC, and uh, I didn't know how to go about it, the mathematics people. Uh, how to, what, what sort of criteria should you use to say whether the machine was good or bad? Well, as an example of the transfer from one area to the other of a simple idea was when we were testing the proximity fuses years before, we used a what was called sequential testing that was invented by a, an Israeli uh, mathematician called uh, Abraham Walls. And it enabled you to but perform a sequential test in the following way. You would take your things and test them one by one. And uh, the progress of the test was influenced by what the results were. So if you plotted the uh, number of successes versus the number tested on a graph, you'd get something lined that went up, zigzag up and down. And what Ball did was to give you a, uh, a, 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 an algorithm for drawing two lines here. And as you tested, you watched to see how long it took your test to step out of the boundaries, out of the bounds, the channel layer. And it was very effective and very simple to calculate. It was a, almost a mental calculation. Uh, to, to decide whether the line was had reached going over its boundary or not, and those were used for testing the fuses. So I thought, why not use the same idea for testing the univac? So we devised a, a number of simple 
things to do and uh, set the machine to doing them and kept track of the successes and his failures and, and uh, you know, complete, completing the job. And I, I remember uh, to, uh, calculating the, the parameters to use for designing that test and then we used it on the UNIVAC. Incidentally, uh, prior to the UNIVAC, there was the BINAC, which was a machine we went at two megacycles, but never really completely worked. I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem, in the historical record, it doesn't seem to have ever worked completely. Well, it was, it was sort of accepted and, yeah. and forget about it, uh, <laughs> forget about the errors. Uh, that came up later when I was at IBM. Apparently the uh, Remington Rand people wanted a patent on the multiplier they use. And, uh, well, everybody had been making multipliers before and after that, and it really was, uh, IBM objected to it. But I didn't really have anything to do with that. So I was uh, on one side of the fence at, at the I, time. I didn't realize until I was looking through the notes today, especially the one you mentioned about the testing algorithms for UNIVAC, that, mm -hmm. that the customer was really MBS. And, I'm sorry, the... Uh, Customer was a Census Bureau. But census Bureau. But, but Univac's customer was really Sperry Rand's customer. Excuse me. Was really you, the NBS? You had to. No, uh, no, no. That. We, we no, were. No. Uh, Excuse me, did consultants. It was the de Census Department was in the Department of Commerce, and the Bureau of Standards is in the Department of Commerce. Okay. So we, t for the Department of Commerce, we tested the Univac to tell the Department of Commerce it was okay for census. That that's sense. how it happened. That makes a lot more yeah, sense. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why we were in the Department of Commerce, but that we were a physics, uh, really essentially a physics laboratory, well, chemistry. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a mini university, the Bureau in those days, with a beautiful campus and a lovely library. I have a story about that. I don't know whether it fits in with your well, uh, the ADX2 story. No, that's that's another story. Well, that's the Department of Commerce and Congress. In, do, in doing this, the Bureau of Standards invoked the wrath of the incoming Eisenhower administration, people who ended in the in the uh, the, the department and. Uh, they threatened to fire him. And uh, he's a good friend of ours and of everybody else. And we signed a petition saying Bureau of Standards people would, would resign. 2,000 of us were going yeah, to resign. To resign. Wow. Now, what, ha what <laughs> and happened? It defied a Senate, commuter, a Senate committee, but they ended up by apologizing to him. That was the yeah. only time I ever remember when all the scientists became like, like uh, mm -hmm. labor, you know, we mm -hmm. just organized. Because mm -hmm. it, was, it was wrong. It was just it, wrong. It, it was somebody to tell us more about that, or is it? Well, we can tell you about well, it. It has nothing to do with computers. I have a question for you. Being in this business, maybe you can say, what do you do with a document that uh, uh, illustrates a scandal that took place 50 years ago and it has some momentous implications. I'll tell you what it is. What it is. <clears throat> this fellow invented some, the idea <clears throat> of putting miscellaneous sulfates in a battery. And what was his name? I've forgotten. His name was uh, Jess uh, uh, was called the ADX battery yeah. case. Uh, uh, he was not a scientist, and he was putting he, a lot of junk in well, and said it was going to help yeah. your battery. He, he, he was selling a penny's worth of this miscellaneous junk mm -hmm. and uh, selling it for packages for dollars. And the Federal Trade Commission caught him up for fraud, mm -hmm. mail fraud. And uh, he objected. And when the, uh, the, the uh, Federal Trade Commission had sent the stuff to the Bureau 
for testing, and they provided this information. I don't really know who the people were. Well, when the new administration, new administration came in, they uh, were looking for trouble, <laughs> and they gra grabbed this uh, case, and uh, they invited him to testify before the Senate committee, who were, of course, half Republicans and half Democrats. And the Republicans were, said, here was an example of where the uh, Bureau had, uh, the director of the Bureau had accepted money from the manufacturers of storage batteries. And uh, they were, you know, all excited over that. Biased. They called him a liar and a thief and so on. Well, that went on for two days after they had fired him. And all of a sudden, they called up the director and said, well, we know we called you a liar and a thief, but we didn't really mean anything bad by it. That, that's the way they were. <laughs> the name, the name yeah. of the Department mm. of Commerce mm. chief mm. under the Eisenhower administration, I still remember, was Sinclair Weeks? No. Sinclair. Anyway, I Eisenhower had appointed this head of the Department of Commerce, and as I told you, the Bureau was in the Department of Commerce. Mm. Now, the head of the Bureau of Standards was Alan Aston, who happened to be the man who hired me. We, he was a good friend of ours, and we respected him as most of the, he was a scientist, and most of us respected him. So when the Department of Commerce fired the Bureau Chief, uh, Aston. Aston, we were just appalled because we knew that what Aston said was based on the research had been done at the Bureau, which was legitimate. But senators were backing this other man because they, you know, they invented the reason why the Bureau wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, we all, as I said, 2,000 of us signed this statement saying that unless he was reinstated, we would resign. You know what that would have done to the Bureau? So that caught someone's attention, all right. We were probably so, bluffing. So the head, of the, the head of the Department of Commerce said to Dr. Aston, well, we didn't really mean anything bad by it. They only fired him. So they well, reappointed him. Well, there's a, a, a second part, too, to this story. <laughs> no, that well, was that what happened in 1953, 53, 54. Uh, in uh, 1976, that's 25 years later, <laughs> Henry and I took a trip around the world, <laughs> and we uh, stopped in, Bani in uh, Manila in the Philippines, and I bought a newspaper and opened it up, <laughs> and there is an advertisement for ADX2. For this is ADX battery. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and it contained, it said ADX2 has been approved by the Senate of the United States <laughs> and uh, all kinds of junk like that. Uh, and uh, there was a cartoon in it, you know, saying, indicating the scientists being uh, rebuffed by the businessmen, and so <laughs> small business types and so on. Well, so I, I looked at this and I hadn't remembered the Democrats or the other minor members of the committee. There were obscure people. At that time, 25 they were years, obscure, and I just didn't remember them. It had nothing to do with my present loss of memory. So I looked at the, at the heading, and who do you suppose was on it? John F. Kennedy, Jr. Not I'm an obscure a, person anymore. He I was not only president of the United States, Hubert Humphrey, I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, another ca candidate for presidency, a defeated one, and uh, Barry Goldwater, another, <laughs> another man who was defeated for the, ca for the uh, pre presidency. And my question is, should I do anything with this piece of paper? <laughs> uh, and if so, who would be interested in buying it? Uh, and does, is it uh, a valid historical subject? Uh, there are a lot of important questions involved there. We actually, we did nothing because it was our 25th wedding anniversary and we were taking this gala, wonderful trip that we had planned so long and we decided somebody else was going to have to. We should definitely hang on to it. This paper is... Uh 
I don't think you have it anymore. The one from the Philippines. Is that what you oh, have? I certainly do have it. Yeah. You do have I, it. I preserved it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. If I die, it'll get thrown out. It sure will. Well, we would probably take it here now that you've explained it. Well, but that has nothing to do with computers. It has nothing to do with computers. Yeah. True. It has to do anyway, with the influence of politics. Honey, and we've side tr yeah. we're sidetracked. Well, Let's get back on what so, Dave wants to find um, out from us. Dysiac, anything else we want to say on, on that? Well, so, Dysiac. Uh, how did it work? We finished with it and tested it, and it seemed to work. Practically all of it was there except a few uh, supplementary parts that we never got around to because the, the uh, uh, signal core got very frantic about getting it on time. And uh, so we had to ship it out, uh, on a, ship the trailer truck out to White Sands, New Mexico, proving ground. And I went out to look at it a year or two later and to, to see how they were doing. And uh, what I found out mainly was the white sand is proving ground. It's covered with very fine white sand, dust white sand. And most of that white sand was lodged inside the computer, drawn in by the ventilating system. So the stuff was buried in sand. The, uh, the uh, the secretary and all the machinery was buried in sand because nobody had thought of what kind of filter should have been put on the. So I was either disappointed with that. Was it no longer working then? Uh, well, they were, were trying to work with it, but they were at first to clean out this, uh, this sand that had gotten in it, and they, they just had a couple of fellows there working on it. And what was it? Was it for fire control? Or yeah, yeah, yes. Well, it was for the, the uh, this diro type thing, dynamic oh, yes. representations of operations, and um, for tr tr tracking aircraft and for at attacking them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't we don't never knew the uh, precise uh, details of, of that any more than we knew the precise details of the encoding and so on. Any, uh, what happened to that machine? Any idea? We have small parts of it here, believe it or not. Oh, really? you do? Yeah. How did you small get it? We got it uh, about a year and a half ago from someone in Michigan. Oh. I, I don't know what the connection is. I think it was the son of someone who worked Who in there. Michigan would? I can look into it if you like. Well, uh, uh, let's see. Good? Harry Good. Was it good? Uh, Harry Good, but I don't know that he had, he had died by then. Yeah. Uh, I can check easily in our Maybe database. it was Harry Good. I'll let you know. No, I don't think so. No? Uh, so who, uh, after Dysiac, do we want to uh, cover the, the pilot? The pilot, yeah. Now yeah. that was interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, the pilot was intended to be be used as a, a uh, central nucleus for attaching other computer-like uh, uh, devices to it so that you could uh, <laughs> You know, not, not go through this endless uh, business of having to build new equipment every time you. Is it fair to say it's like an erector set for? Yeah, some, you, somewhat. You can, it's very modularized. You would it. attach an erector set to it, but uh, it would be the nucleus was the uh, was the machine, which employed essentially the same circuitry, speeded up a little bit, and of course, uh, I haven't mentioned transistors because they weren't available then, were just coming into availability. So it, uh, the, the chances were that it was going to be, not going to be competitive with the transistor machine, but we didn't know that yet. Anyway, you, we used our technology on it, and it had a long list of operations it could do. And uh, the uh, operations were, were performed by different units that operated in parallel. There was a, a primary computer, which was, you might call, more or less classical in its operations, and a secondary computer that was specialized to do the uh, so-called red tape operations. And uh, 
oh, minor bookkeeping and so on that had to do with the running of the program rather than the essential uh, arithmetic or whatnot that the machine was doing. And then there was a, a third computer which was uh, had, was programmed by, by a, a uh, plug board, the type of input instead, which was very flexible since you could do almost anything on the pl plug boards. And uh, that uh, took care of the uh, idiosyncrasies of the input-output f uh, formats of protocols or, or whatnot and was you know, most flexible in that you could put anything you, you pleased on the, program, on the, uh, on the uh, plug board type thing. And it did certain more or less simple operations. <clears throat> One of the reports I read, uh, very preliminary to uh, pilot, said actually compared transistors and vacuum tubes and made a case that vacuum tubes were actually the desirable, the optimum choice because transistors were, while exciting and, and, and containing a lot of potential, were still a little flaky uh, in terms of <laughs> making large numbers of them you know, mass producible. Mm -hmm. And that you, you, the report, I think, I think you wrote it, mentioned the Transac and the, the Lark. And well, I, I, don't, I don't think I wrote that, uh, no. but um, okay. I was just telling you what was in it. Uh, right. I don't know where it came from. Uh, yeah. But it's interesting uh, that vacuum someone, tubes yeah. were still considered, uh, you know, that, that reliability was more important maybe than kind of pushing the envelope on the device technology. Well, yes, of course, the customers don't want us to. They don't really care uh, either way, probably. Yeah. The, well, they want it to work, I yes, mean, exactly. it's, uh, on time. Yeah. And, um, a couple of other things architecturally that I found interesting, mm -hmm. and by the way, was this ever built? Yes, it was built, yeah. except that we only had a small piece of memory. We brought the memory, we needed to buy the memory from somewhere else, and the funds disappeared. And when the funds disappeared, That's why he left. We, we disappeared. Uh, just the whole department? Uh, not the whole department. No, just his section. A handful of people nice. in my group. He, he went to uh, IBM. He got, uh, the IBM research mm. offered mm. him, and he wanted to bring his key people with him, so they started a, they made a place for them in IBM. Well, we didn't do anything at IBM that related to the work we did prior, the earlier work. Now, interrupts were a big oh. pilot. Tell us a bit about that, because that was pretty, you know, well, pretty uh, that, Yes, well, uh, they were part of the manual monitor, which uh, I forget when I first used that term. Uh, I think it's SEAC, but anyway, on DARCIAC, uh, the uh, it, it was part of the idea that uh, the machine was a, a member of a team of things that were doing things asynchronously, and uh, it was really be an asynchronous in the in the fact that if the first machine transferred something to the second machine. It had no idea how long it would take or what the result would be and uh, until the second machine reported back whatever the type of result was, which could be anything, for, you know, anything conceivable. So there were a class of different things that could interrupt either of the two programs you know, with uh, a uh, so a choice of the well of the protocol that would, would be followed by it, and uh, it, it seemed, you know, as I worked on this, that there was an, an awful lot of room for getting all screwed up, and that somehow uh, techniques needed to be uh, invented for keeping straight. And I did a lot of work on things that involved the incidence matrices and uh, pre precedence matrices and uh, th that kind of thing. Graph, graph theory would be invi involved in it too. Uh, for how two machines would communicate with each other in uh, a non-trivial way, I put it that way. When I looked at the mm. uh, basic 
procedural outlines of how this machine was to deal with interrupts, mm -hmm. it was exactly the rules that interrupts follow today. I, they were, really? Uh, really, I mean, you, the interrupt occurs, you, you save the address, you service the interrupt, you pop the address back in return. And so yeah, is that that sort of thing? Well, one, uh, early, one of the earliest uses of interrupts was that that? Well, that was a secondary computer, which I just mentioned, mm. would do the fooling around with the results which determined whether it was an interrupt to occur or not. Right. Uh, the first thing, first thing is the primary interrupting the secondary, if it need be, and it might be busy with something else, too, so... Another mm. thing I thought was really prescient of, of you was to note uh, about networks, computers talking yeah. to other computers. And yeah. I, I was really shocked. This was such a long time ago, and it really sounded yeah, that, like that made yeah. a big impression when he wrote that paper. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about, about that and well, that, what I, you envisioned? I mean, that paper organizing a uh, network of computers to meet deadlines. To meet deadlines. That was the subject of the uh, IEEE uh, meeting, I think. and. Uh, I outlined uh, some of the ways to model the system. Uh, I didn't know that they, you know, really uh, were carried out by other people to the extent that I hadn't seen them described. And uh, they're hard to describe anyway. Uh, yes, they, they, a lot of things are sort of obvious, and they're good ideas. But you have to look at them closely, and they uh, turn out to be very, very complicated. They're not so simple as, as they seemed on the outside. Well, you know, what can you say about the accuracy of software today? I mean, the, the uh, Microsoft uh, puts out stuff that... Uh, Don't get them uh, started. It's uh, <laughs> uh, proofread by the clerks, well, I think. Real, you know, metaphysical issues, mm -hmm. it's easy to prove there's a bug, but it's not easy to prove there's not a bug. <laughs> so proving you know, correctness has always been a real problem. Yes, and uh, computers and reliability mm -hmm. proving that. I, I don't know if I have any good ideas about that, but we've got more uh, problems with the uh, internet now than anybody ever dreamed of before. Yes, these uh, mm -hmm. large technical systems always have unintended consequences when they start interacting with other large technical <laughs> right, right. Um, mm. So, uh, are there any lessons uh, from Pilot did, that you learned? Or, I mean, this was pretty well your last project, I guess, at the and Bureau. I'm at and the and Bureau. And then you went to IBM, which I'd like to also mm. ask you about. So. You know, um, there's a story about the Pilot. Um, he gave a, a talk about it at that first um, United Nations um, computer session in Paris. Oh, I forget yeah. the exact name of it. I think I told you the story before about red tape, what red tape means. Uh, no, you better tell her. That, that's oh, a funny that. story. Oh, it's red it's tape in connection with this UN meeting, mm -hmm. their first meeting on computers, mm -hmm. where he gave a paper on the pilot. And, when the, and at the meeting, they have translators um, German, French, Russian, you know, simultaneous translations, so that while you're speaking, everybody understands it. So well, apparently... Well, this was before the meeting. Before the yeah. meeting, you have to speak to the translator. All right, you te tell yeah. the story. So, so we got, got, to, got together with a, a Frenchman and a Russian, and uh, they said, would you explain any technical terms that will need special translation? So. I said, when it came my turn, I said, uh, describe, you know, what a red tape operation means. Uh, and uh, they, they took it in. And uh, he went to the Frenchman and said, do you have a, a, a phrase that has this meaning? And the Frenchman said, well, we have a phrase called uh, Papara, which means uh, confetti or fancy paper objects. I don't know exactly what it means. And he said, we use it to mean, you know, frivolous kind of paperwork. 
and the Russian turned to the Russian and said, and do you have uh, red tape? And he said, in Russia, we have no red tape. <laughs> I love that story. In Russia, there's no red tape. Especially red. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's good. Well, so, anyway. Yeah, IBM, and uh, I don't want to track your career as well. You know, what, so you, you went, to, I guess, back to New York? In 1960, he decided to, uh, well, when, when it became known that he was thinking of leaving the Bureau, what do you call them, the headhunters? Yeah, they started phoning. <laughs> well, the kids couldn't get through to call us because the phone was busy all the time. Well, anyway, um, of the options that he had, he decided to go to IBM Research in Yorktown Heights, New York. And I decided at that time that it was a good chance as he was getting much more money from IBM than he was getting from the government. It was a good chance for me to change fields because I had been wanting to do that. What, what amazed me was what he went through to get computers to do the kind of problem solving that they had to do the size of the equipment and how the connections were so complicated. And, you know, I watched him design and it was no easy task. But we had children who had little heads, smart. They could solve things not as fast as computers, but they were much better at problem solving. And I kept thinking, what's what kind of connections are there in the brain that ena enables human people, little, you know, when you, you don't have to be an adult, you have to be fairly, you, you can't be two or three, but when they began to be logical and, and the problem solvers, Seven. it Seven got so eight. interesting to see what those, what those little heads could do compared to the, <coughs> the big heads. compared to <laughs> roomfuls of equipment that he had to use uh, to yes. do comparable stuff. So I told him that as long as, and, and I didn't get an offer from IBM anyway. So I wasn't in the computer group because I was in the two player. Anyway, uh, I told him I wanted to uh, go back to school. So we, we agreed on that. And uh, that was really fascinating. It was just, it was a wonderful time for me because well, what I actually did was I was going to get a PhD in neuroanatomy, but the professor who taught the uh, course in neuroanatomy that I started on, the poor man had a rough time with me because I kept saying to him, I have to know exactly which computer goes, you know, I was thinking in terms of computer design, I have to know exactly where these connections go, not just in general, you know. and he. The first thing he said was, thank God you didn't come here 25 years ago. I can do a little better. But I can't do enough for you here. You have to go to medical school. We have interdisciplinary courses. I think you'll learn more. And I said, well, I, I really can't go to medical school. We were putting kids through Ivy League schools and taking it out of his salary, and I just couldn't see it. I couldn't go home and tell him, you have to put me through medical school. <laughs> So what happened was that I got invited to go. He said, I think you'll make a contribution. Come. You can take whatever courses you want. We'll teach you. The only thing you have to promise is to take all the tests and do all the lab work that the regular medical students do. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted. So it didn't cost me a nickel. It was wonderful. And. Uh, they let me take the courses that I wanted, and it was glorious. Columbia, at that time, had the best neuroanatomy course in the country. I was told that by a lot of people. And I found it so. It's, it was a remarkable course. At that time, people weren't so concentrated on the molecular parts of the brain, which is what this and the genetic parts, which are of major interest now. So that my interest in how the system was organized was closer 
to what they could teach me, because I wasn't interested in the molecular part. Right. What I was trying to find out was, I was trying to see whether there was any analogy between computers and any part of the brain with respect to this. Do they take units, similar units, and, and collect modules of them and put them together in such a way that it can do a variety of things depending on what the connections are from that unit to other units in the brain? So really, I concentrated on connections because of what I had learned from what he did. And um, I was just amazed at the backwardness of the way they were thinking about information processing in the medical schools. They, it was a static kind of way of looking at the brain instead of looking at it as a working information processing mechanism. There was also the amount people said, Transistors are transistors, and neurons are neurons, and how could they have anything to do with well, each other? Well, I never claimed that they were similar. I just <laughs> said, in terms of symbolic logic, I was thinking in right. terms <laughs> of the theory. Yes. I never said they were similar, but Alan always said that the basic information processing element in a computer needs very few basic properties. If it has those basic properties, you can make a computer out of them. But it doesn't have to be what a neuron is. It could be a lot simpler. So I try to look at it from the point of view, does it have the basic elements that he said were necessary in theory? And how were they connected? And it was so exciting. It was really fascinating. And if I hadn't gone through the Bureau of Standards and all this development in the computer field, I doubt if I would have come to view the cerebellum as I did. You made connections yourself. Well, actually, we, we, we think that now uh, nobody will dispute what we proposed then, which they thought was wild. There was a, an article in the New York Times about our work back a couple of years ago in which um, it was written by Sandra Blakesley, who writes a lot of the science articles in which she quoted some of our colleagues as saying, when we heard the Linus hypothesis, we thought they were nuts, which they did. Uh, uh, but, and, and then they said, but now we're, conver we're converse of something, believers. Now we're believers. Right. So, can, um, can you give us a 30-second explanation of what you dis discovered? Well, the connections from the cerebellum, I started analyzing, the, the, the reason I got into the cerebellum was that it seemed likely to me that that would be the most computer-like part of the brain. It had a, a uniform, the entire, the entire um, extent of it was uniform. It consists of longitudinal um, units, which are exactly the same, each one. What What's different is that one part of the cerebellum goes one place in the br brain and another part goes another place. So I started looking at these longitudinal units. So what the interesting part about it is everybody knew that the cerebellum controlled motor functions. You know, if, if you damage your cerebellum, you're crippled in some way. And that was it, motor function, you know. They're still teaching that, I think, except the research is no better now. Anyway, what I found was that the phylogenetically older part of the cerebellum, the part that's available in all pri primates, mammals, you know, everybody all the way back, all vertebrates, are connected, they have a part of the cerebellum connected to the motor functions of the brain which in, in primates, there's a motor strip at the top of the, the top of the brain in the cerebral cortex. That's the top motor function which controls. But the phylogenetically newest part of the cerebellum, which is only in humans and which you begin to see in apes, it's not in any lower primates, it's not in other mammals, it's not in other vertebrates. That part of the cerebellum goes not to the motor part, 
of the cerebral cortex, but to the prefrontal part, which is connected to the what they call executive functions or planning and intellectual functions. So I got in touch with a neurologist called Robert Dow. He was very well known. He wrote the Bible on the cerebellum. It's a D-O-W. D-O-W, yeah. And um, he, uh, he was the head of the uh, Neuroscience Institute, Neurological Institute in Portland, Oregon at the Good Samaritan Hospital. And I was very lucky because he got interested in what I was saying. He said if I, would, if I was right, it would help explain something that he wondered about for 50 years. And that was why this newest part of the cerebellum, when it's damaged, doesn't, doesn't produce motor deficits. And he didn't know what deficit to look for. So I said, let's look for an intellectual deficit, a deficit in planning. I bet you that's it. So we waited for patients in his institute to get damaged in the right part of the cerebellum. And when he got a patient, he called me up and he said, I've got a patient. I was so happy and Alan said, oh, the poor man. You know, he was still human, but I was, I was. So they tested him at bedside and as he recovered, and there was a planning deficit. So we wrote our first paper, the three of us, Alan and I and Dr. Dow, in 1986. And I gave a talk at the American, uh, the AAAS, um, in 1986, in which I challenged the psychologists and the uh, neuro neuroscientists to um, see if our hypothesis had more merit, that we already had this evidence and we needed more. So there's a whole cottage industry now. In 1997, a book was published by a Harvard colleague of ours called The Cerebellum and Cognition. We wrote a chapter in it, of course. It's a whole book full. So um, from 1986 to the present, they do ha the researchers do have a different view of the cerebellum on account of us. Yes. Well, so we're so thrilled. <laughs> That was really exciting. Yeah, we just uh, saw, read a, an article, I think it was in Science, a week or two ago, in which your viewers said, uh, cognitive workers are, uh, it's well known to cognitive workers that uh, part of the brain works like a, like a computer. <laughs> well known. Well known, yeah. yeah. When we started, we couldn't get anybody to listen yeah. to us. But anyway, if that, the, the work on the brain took everything that I had learned until then. Really, it was hard, but so satisfying because it's good to be challenged if you can, if you can handle it. Yes. And the work we had done previously on computers was responsible for making this contribution to the brain, which I think is, is great. Yeah.